one again. Recording in progress. Okay, good morning. Let's pray and we're going to dive in. Um, Lord God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for um, cool air. We thank you for fall and seasons and the rhythm of life that keeps us day in and day out. We thank you for hearts that continue to beat. Lord, breath that continues to go in and out. Lord, let the mundane of life not be lost on us. Then we might see the provision of your hand in any and everything that we are witnessing and participating in. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, for you are my rock and my redeemer. And Lord, if anything comes out of me that is not from you, Lord, forgive me. And I pray that you would teach this lesson, Lord because the, you're the one who provides the inheritance. You're the one who fights for it. You are the one who is the champion of our hearts, Lord. We are bought. And so, Lord, we turn to you and we beg for you to open the eyes of our hearts that we might see you clearly, Lord, that we might follow you wholeheartedly like your servant, Caleb. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, let us begin. You would think that I wouldn't have a lot to say since it was just a bunch of lists, but I've got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of things to say. So we're going to get started and just know I'm going to be talking fast and we're all going to survive at the end and have lunch. Okay. I love Sarah's big idea last week about the um, big picture of what Joshua is. I thought it was perfect. And it is, there's a huge battle that is raging to establish God's kingdom on earth. And God himself will fight it for us. And it will cost him everything. I just, I love that. And that's true. And that's the battle that we are fighting alongside the commander of God's army. And so, and, and we're going to do a kind of a rapid fire. Where are we now? Because we're getting ready to shift gears in this third section that we're entering into today. So um, first, chapters one through five, what do we see the people of Israel doing? I've given you the answer right there. What do we see them doing? We're in pre preparing, right? They're in preparation. Um, they are preparing to enter into the promised land and doing it according to the word of God. So Joshua is called by God to lead the people like Moses led the people. And Joshua invites the people of God into the promised land. And they say, yes, we will go. We will do it. And why can they be strong and courageous? We talked about a couple of reasons why they can be strong and courageous to do this really hard thing. Why? Because the living God is among them. God himself is with them. He will be with them wherever they go. One, what is the other thing? It's really important that we remember this other thing. He told them something really important. He told them the end of the story. He, do, do what? No, well, he told them to meditate on the law. To meditate on the word. But he told them that I've done it. I have won the victory it is on me i have done it i have won it he tells them the end of the story and so they go with god himself represented by the ark stepping into the flood waters of the jordan stopped by the ark right and before the excuse me and before they annihilate the objects of god's wrath God taps the break for us in his word and gives us chapter two. What does he want us to zero in on in chapter two? God's heart. He wants us to see God's heart played out in whose story? Rahab. What does that tell us about God's heart? Is, his, is, is he first and foremost annihilation? No. Gracious, abounding, steadfast love, offering his salvation. Right again and again and again and again. So he shows us, he drills us before we get to this next section. He shows us how he plucks out Rahab. I will pass over her like I passed over you people 
Be my people and show me your commitment by your obedience. Circumcise yourselves and celebrate the Passover. You have been passed over. She is being plucked out and passed over. And I want you all to recognize that about my heart first, right? Then we get into chapter 6 through 12. And it ain't pretty. We have annihilation. And we have, what that is, it is the massive wholesale judgment of a righteous God in heaven. Sarah explained that this is a historical narrative told in the ancient Near, Near East battle language, right? The, the conquest language of the time period. So yes, the author uses absolutely grand hyperbole. He says he left none remaining, um, did not leave anyone who breathed, right? Those are really big grand words for the judgment of Israel swiping in through Canaan. And yet they aren't all gone yet, which we're going to talk about today. A lot of them are still around, but it's the writing style of the time. And that helps us authenticate the words of the Bible, because if it was written in a different type of language, you would know that it was written too far after the fact. Okay, so this is the style of the time. So we have to accept the style for what it is. It is the styling of a very true story. So when you look at it kind of that way, you, it doesn't kind of shake us in our, you know, in our foundation. It is the word of God and it happened. But the author in that time period carried along by the Holy Spirit is writing it in a particular style that spoke to the people at that time. It is stylized. Now, what we know for sure is verse 11, 20. 11. Excuse me, yeah, chapter 11, verse 20. For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy, but be destroyed, just as the Lord God had commanded Moses. That isn't hyperbole. That's just truth. And so that is what we are going to tap on the brakes a little bit and meditate on, because if we don't pause right here, just for a second, we're never ready to go here. So we're going to pause just for a second. Lesson four in, in your homework at one point in time in lesson four last week, it asked, wouldn't you love to rehearse the great victories and conquests? Like, what does that do for your heart? And for me, it honestly kind of grosses me out. When you think of the wholesale slaughter of men, women, and children and the hamstringing of horses, you know, I, we can romanticize ah, the conquest of God and so forth, but we have got to realize the judgment of God. The people of Canaan suffered full and complete weight of the wrath of a holy and almighty God. And God used the people of Israel as that instrument and as that tool of judgment. And they were told by God to devote them to destruction. And God himself hardens their, the hearts of his enemies in order that they would be shown no mercy. That is not what we lead with in evangelism, right? <laughs> it is not. That is a scary, serious teaching. And intellectually, we need to pause here and recognize that the God of the Old Testament is the same God today. It is not as though Jesus stepped into history and was like, whoa, 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 that God's gone, okay? And I'm just smoothing out all that my daddy did back in the Old Testament. I mean, that, that is not the Bible. And so um, the Old Testament God is not outdated and wrong. And so when we look at these, hi, Carla, if we, in our modern day sensibilities, we can't lean into this question, like, how dare God do such a thing? That is, that is the wrong question. We don't ask, how could a loving God do that? The right question is, why didn't he do that to me? That's the question, but we have to kind of, we have to wrestle with that 
because I promise you the rest of the world is wrestling with that. Yeah. Yeah. And so if we don't have answers to those and don't come to a reconciliation with that, then we're kind of off balance because that God is Jesus. Okay. And when I was in, oh, wait, this is a really fascinating book called Show the No Mercy, Read It, Don't Read It, It Doesn't Matter. But it's four perspectives on the Canaanite genocide. And you have four perspectives and then you have rebuttals after each chapter. And um, Tripper Longman is my favorite chapter. I think he does a really good job of just really framing it this way um, in what we're saying. But he's quoting a, a, a woman named Meredith Klein, a brilliant Old Testament theologian. And he quotes her saying, Klein reminds us that the punishment for sin is death. The lesson that rebellion and all sin is rebellion leads to death is made clear in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2, chapter, Genesis 2, 17. It is only because of God's extraordinary grace mm -hmm. that Adam and Eve were not killed on the spot mm -hmm. when they ate that fruit. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it is because of that grace that any of us breathe. The period of God's extraordinary grace, often called common grace, is a special circumstance. In light, in this light, we should not be amazed that God ordered the death of the Canaanites, but rather we should stand in amazement that he lets any one of us live. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. That's how we stand. Isn't it amazing that any of us live, that any of us breathe? That any of us weren't just struck down from the get-go, like Ananias and Sapphira? That's the amazing part here. When I was in college, I was having lunch with a good guy friend who I later married. And <laughs> we were in a deep discussion, and he said he really didn't believe in hell. Like, no, God, the God that I know would never send anyone to hell. And I clearly remember asking him, well, if there's no hell, what was the purpose of Jesus? And this, what we're reading about, this right here is hell. This is the wrath of God that we are seeing. And this is what we deserve. And um, until we realize the depth of just how bad we actually are, we will never fall on our faces in the wonder of all that God has done for us. The people of Canaan received what we as the church never will. Psalm 75 verse 8 says, for in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it all the wicked of the earth. And excuse me, and he pours out from it and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. That is the cup that Canaan is drinking. And the only reason why we don't drink it is why, ladies? Because Jesus drank it for us. He drank it for us. He was in the garden begging his heavenly father to remove it from his lips. And let me tell you what, if anybody knew about the judgment of God, it was Jesus. He knew what that cup meant. And he begged to not do it. And yet, it's Psalm 75, 8. 75. And yet, not my will, but yours, O oh Father. And so... Jesus was our Jericho for us. That's what we're seeing here. He was our Jericho. For you and for me, he was completely crushed, devoted for destruction for me. God is holy and just and righteous, and this is what makes him God. He must be a righteous judge. And as Paige Brown says, God must be a righteous judge to be God. He must dispense justice. He doesn't have to save. Hmm. To be God, 
he must be just. He doesn't have to save to be God. Our God became the sacrifice for our unrighteousness, and he did not have to. But that's not where the story ends. And that's where we are today. Then this is the next section of Joshua. Here we stand in Israel, who has just been used as this massive instrument of judgment upon the people of Canaan. And God doesn't just leave them there. Remember how Rahab wasn't just forgiven and then let out of the city to just go and like be with her family in the woods somewhere? She's brought in to the people of God and given a part in the genealogy of Jesus. So after the annihilation, these people are given a land. They're given an inheritance. They're given a home. They're not just passed over. They get all that God has to provide in his abundance. And that's where we are. It's astounding. So let's get into um, where we are now in, y'all, my, I've stacked up too many papers. Hold on. Let me get out my observation worksheets. Okay, here we are. Get out at your observation worksheets. Chapter 13, we have a clear shift in the beginning of this chapter. What is it? Where, what's going on now? We have this clear shift. Josh was old. Josh was old, right? Josh was old. And kind of what's happening now? The territories are being divided. The are being divided. Excellent. The territory... We've conquered the land like we have really put these bad guys on the back foot, right? We have really done a lot. We, you went into last week um, how they, they attacked through the middle to divide and then they went to the north and the south and like, you know, this, this whole structure for how they were going to annihilate and put the people on the back foot. And now Joshua's sitting down going, okay, you ready? It's time to inhabit the land, right? Here we see a picture of the already and not yet. It's time to go in the land and enjoy the fruits of your labors, right? The promises of God. But it's not totally all complete yet, right? And that's what we wrestle with in the kingdom of God. Who remembers how we define the kingdom? I can't remember who's all been everywhere, every year. So I kind of got to repeat myself. So I'm sorry if you're like, oh, we know this. But anyway, for those of you who weren't here with us or who've just slept since then, how do we define kingdom? Anybody remember? Ooh. Yeah. Good. Yeah. The kingdom of God is very simply, it's where God rules and he reigns. Right? Is there anywhere that he is not? No. Thank you. Is there anything that he is not able to do? No. Is anything out of his control? No. no. The answer is no. And yet, we still struggle. Raise your hand if you still struggle. And like, the Lord Jesus doesn't seem to be reigning and ruling in your heart all the time. <laughs> right? Right. Colossians says that all things were created in him and for him and in him, all things hold together. And yet we groan, all of creation groans with us in anticipation for the final coming of the king to his kingdom. We call that the consummation, right? And so we see the people of Israel leaning in and pushing out the kingdom of God into this land and the gates of hell not prevailing against it. That's what you're seeing in this conquest and this inhabitation, this annihilation. You're seeing the conquering of the promised land. And yet the enemy remains. The struggle, they fall, they disobey, they grow weary of doing good. That's what we experience. How do we see that? Well, you looked at number two on page 45. When you're comparing, like, what do we see that's still going on here? What did you see? The still 
they're still the Canaanites. Exactly. And as long as we wait for Jesus to return, as long as we wait for the kingdom to come, to, for the king to come back and consummate his kingdom, the work isn't finished. That makes me tired. But it's true. The work is not finished. God says in chapter 13, verse 2, this is the land that yet remains, all the regions of the Philistines. Are you kidding me? Do you all remember you know your Bible? You know who the Philistines are. Talk about a thorn and a snare. Get ready for centuries of the Philistines from here on out. All of the Girgashites, Canaanites, Sidonians, Am Sidonians, Amorites, I'm getting tired and this isn't even my list. There's heaps and heaps and heaps of bad yet to go in this kingdom. And I say it's not my list, but it is, isn't it? Because just like Sarah taught last week, where does the primary battle rage? In our hearts. Lord, you mean I still have to battle selfishness, sloth, and pride? I'm so tired and I'm still so young. I've got a lot of life left to live and I have a lot to talk to my children. Heaps of battling yet to do. But what does God say in verse six? I myself, verse thir sorry, chapter 13, verse six, I myself will drive them out before, before the people of Israel. Only allot the land of Israel to their inheritance for an inheritance as I've commanded you. I myself will drive them out. Just tell them what they're going to inherit. What does this mean for them? And what does it mean for us today? We've said it already. God has told us the end of the story. He's told us the end of the story again and again and again. He's told them the end of the story again and again and again. And he's told us the end of the story again and again and again and again. Behold, 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 all the way through the Bible. Behold, 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 all the way to Revelation. Behold, I'm coming soon, right? Right. He's told us the end of the story. You will win. And in this particular case, right here, right now, as we're reading in Joshua, it's not proverbial. When he says you will win the battle, he means like you will. Like right now we have this heart battle thing. But when he's talking with the Israelites, he's like, incarnationally, I'm talking about people. Get them out. Devote them to destruction. Get them away from you. Drive them out completely. Um, and he was going to use them, this, these battles and these victories, to grow their faith and their awe in him so that they would believe him and they would continue to obey as they saw their victories. They would continue in their faith and continue in their obedience. And the same is true with our non-fleshly battles today. And as Sarah said last week, we are fighting from a position of victory. Christ has told us it is finished. That's kind of metaphorical and hard for me to understand. So I was really digging into it. And I'm going to get rid just turn on your listening ears. If I'm talking too fast, just listen. I'm going to just pour scripture over you that helped me really understand what this means to fight from victory. Because it kind of, I don't know, clicked for me this week. And this is how, so maybe it'll click for you. Maybe not keep wrestling with it because it's in God's word. So as we said, this we're not um, fighting Canaanites. They're not people storming in our doors as there are in other places, but not here for us today. Ephesians 6, 12, for we ladies in this room don't wrestle against flesh and blood as they did, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places Therefore, everybody, let's take up the whole armor of God that he gives us. Why? So that we are able. We can. We are able to withstand the evil day, having done all to stand firm. First Thessalonians 5, 23, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls you as faithful. He will do it. First Corinthians 15, 57 through 58. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved sisters, be steadfast, immovable, 
abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. We can battle. This is not in the scripture. This is my commentary. We can battle and we can win against the enemy because Jesus has already won. This is what he is teaching us today. Yes, we can change our screen habits. We can change our eating habits. We can change the way I spend my time or spend my money or run my mouth. I can. We can do this because Colossians 3 to 5 says, put to death that which is sinful in us. We once walked in these ways, but now, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has seized us, but what is common to man. But when we are tempted, he is faithful. He will provide a way out so that we can stand up under it. He will. The question is just, will we take it? Will we do it? Now, dear Christian sisters, we need to put to death the, de the sins of the flesh. We belong to Jesus. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are cleansed from all unrighteousness already. So then... 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. And we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we become the righteousness of God. We can fight and we can struggle and we can press on and we can have victory because Jesus has already won for us. This book of Joshua, this inhabiting we are watching is simply a metaphor for us spiritually. Fighting our battle against sin and against the devil and grabbing our inheritance of what he says, this is already yours. Now live like it. We see this happening in a few ways. Now we're kind of moving over here. So in light of our victory in Jesus, how we inhabit our inheritance now on earth, now on earth is evidence of the state of our hearts. <laughs> and we're about to see this played out in a few different ways. Now, briefly, I want to talk about the number of tribes that we see here because this kind of, I never really had thought about this, but you looked at it on um page 49 at the top. How are we getting to the number 12 tribes here? You take out the Levites and you add two Josephs. Okay. There's no tribe of Joseph. There's Ephraim and Manasseh. So you have no Levite minus one plus two gives us a 12. Anyway, so that's how, that's how that's working. Um, and Verse, oh, excuse me, chapter 13, verse 8 begins with a clarification of the inheritance of everybody on the other side of the Jordan. Okay, so that's where we are. We go through this the um, Levi, Reuben, Gad, Manasseh. And let's put ourselves in Israel's shoes for a, for a minute here. You're going through your annual Bible reading plan and you finally slog through Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and you get to Joshua. It's like so awesome. And you're like the commander of the army and battles. Awesome. And you're like, land survey. What a drag. It's a snoozer. I promise you, this was not a snoozer for anybody in real time. Not at all. This was the most exciting thing they had ever heard. Do you know why? They were getting their inheritance. This is like the reading of the will. And dad, father in heaven, he's wealthy. And he's got a lot to give abundantly, right? 
And so they are super excited. This is what their hearts have been yearning for, the promised land, where they will be um, as long as, and that's a great big qualification, as long as they are willing to keep it. That's it. It was supposed to be passed. They, what they are reading about in these next few chapters is supposed to be passed from generation to generation to generation. This is a very special piece of land and to be managed in a very special way. Read Leviticus 25 one day. It is a fascinating read about the land and how God's people were supposed to live in God's place in his presence. And it's all about the year of Jubilee. God knows that there's going to be struggles. Sometimes people are going to go through drought or famine. They're going to get poor and they're going to need to sell their land. But in the year of Jubilee, which was every 50 years, I told you it was going to talk fast. Every year of Jubilee, people were to give the land back. And so if you were going to sell your land, you sold it in the price compared to when the land of Jubilee, excuse me, when the year of Jubilee was going to hit. All of these things are laid out in God's word because he's like, look, the, this land is supposed to be preserved forever and ever in this way. And the people just, well, they just didn't do it right. And that just goes on for centuries after this. But um, the people were delighted. They're like, oh, all that Jubilee stuff is going to happen right here. Okay, where are my borders? Where, okay, where, you know, they, they really cared. This is the joy that has been set before them like a carrot to get them into the promised land and get them to drive out the people. And this is simply a mere dim, dim shadow <clears throat> of our own inheritance. And we're going to focus on ours for just a minute. To focus on our inheritance gives our weary hearts strength to continue. It worked for Jesus. And Hebrews 12, 2 says, for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. That was what was set before him. He fixes his eyes, he fixes his eyes on us as his inheritance. And guess what? We fix our eyes on him. Look with me or just dog ear it for later. I've read, I read this to y'all. Y'all, I'm kind of a one-trick pony, but I love this one. Okay, Psalm 16, verse 5. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life and in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. This is our longing for our eternal home. Pleasures at God's right hand forevermore. And C.S. Lewis has this really funny thing that I won't quote to you because I've got plenty of C.S. Lewis to quote to you later, but um, about how being a Christian, you know, focusing on the rewards in heaven is not a mercenary affair. <laughs> He's like, it's just flat out truth. And so this longing for our eternal home, our eternal habitation has been written on our hearts by our creator. It's been written on every human being's heart since the beginning of time. He designed us all for this longing. Across America right now, high schools and colleges are all celebrating what? Say it if you know it. Homecoming. Homecoming. Right? It's a big deal to go home to wherever you were and celebrate and be home. All I mean, the Lord puts these things in our culture that just point us undeniably to him we all love home but let's be honest how perfect is home really i don't care how great your home life was it was still filled with sinners flawed dysfunctional to some degree even the most incredible home life imaginable is still dimmed with sin and brokenness Paul Trepp read this great poem um, based on that C.S. Lewis quote. I told you I was going to quote him a lot. Again, one trick pony. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote another 
bit in um, Mere Christianity, and it says, if I find myself, a if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And that is true. And so Paul, Paul Tripp wrote this. I give painful evidence every day. I experience it in predictable and unpredictable moments. I guess I should know better, but I am often caught off guard. There is an insatiable longing inside of me, a thirst that never seems to be quenched. This deep hunger doesn't go away, no matter how busy I get or how hard I work to be distracted. I long for justice, love, hope, peace, perfection, satisfaction, mercy, contentment, rest, harmony, joy, and none of these longings ever gets fully satisfied. And so in my quest for more, I am faced with the incontrovertible daily evidence that this simply is not all that there is. And the sure truth that I was hardwired for another world. And so in the following chapters, we see dimly in a mirror, the inheritance laid out for the people of God. <clears throat> Beginning in chapter 13 with Gad, Reuben, and the half tribe, half tribe of Manasseh. So what do we see right away in verse 13? Of, where am I? They didn't drive them out. There we are. Yeah, the people of Israel didn't drive them out. So right here we have this hint of half-heartedness. And we'll come back to this and drill it home, as you can see later. But we're just going to press a bookmark in this and know that it started all the way on the other side of the Jordan. They were not driving them out. But know this, God never leaves or forsakes his people or his plan, even when his people completely forsake him. There's always hope. So that's referring to the east side. Yes, in 13. Another brief, brief bookmark that we're going to put in chapter 13 um, is Levi. I know you studied a little bit about the Levites in your homework, but we're going to just not totally discuss them until we get to chapter 22, because we're going to not just discuss that they didn't get an inheritance. We're going to talk about what their inheritance was. But just briefly, the Lord, the, the Lord God himself is their inheritance, and they were to be spread throughout the land to exemplify his presence among the people. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? A kingdom of priests? Shocker. Christians, little Christians have the presence of God in you. And the Bible teaches us that the blood of the lamb has made us a kingdom of priests. If I continue on the rabbit trail, I won't have anything to talk about in two weeks. So, flip. Going on. Sorry. So we lay out the boundaries of Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh. We mention the Levites and then the narrator zeroes in on my Caleb. Why do you think just like, just like God did before the annihilation? Why does he zero in on Caleb here before he does the whole rest of the promised land? He wholeheartedly followed God. Um, this is our story. Anybody who is in Christ, you can follow God wholeheartedly. And so, um, we're going to just look at Caleb. We're going to zero in on him and because it's, it can be our story. So let's look at him. And this is what we're going to be going through when we, as we look at Caleb. So you all know, I'm going to kind of breeze, breeze through some of this stuff. Spies bring the good news. They bring the bad news. Um, the reports of giants in the land, like the, the land is exceedingly good. And look how big and fat these grapes are. Oh my goodness, we can't even carry them. Um, but then they grumble and they cause the entire congregation to fear and to grumble as well. Um, they even say, let's go back to Egypt. And Numbers, chapter 
sorry. Okay, Numbers chapter 14, verses 5 through 9. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. The Anakim were bred for them. Their protection had been removed. The people threatened to stone Joshua and Caleb and uh, Moses and Aaron, but the glory of God comes down and puts the people in their place. As it sort of should with all of us, right? That's what uh, Paul Tripp talks about, the fact that we all have a glory problem. We all have an awe problem when we find ourselves fearful and, and scared. And what we really need is just to be smacked in the face with the awe of the God who can accomplish anything. So he threatens to destroy, God threatens to destroy the people and start fresh, but Moses intercedes, God pardons them, but gives them the consequences of their sin. Ultimately, he could have wiped them all out. Remember we said that he still would have been God, he, but he doesn't but he allows them the consequences of their sin. You don't want to come into the promised land? Okay, don't come into the promised land. Wander. Who has to suffer with the people of God for 40 years? And can you imagine? That is some sustained obedience. He has to wander with this miserable grumbling, complaining, dying people for 40 years. I have a hard time hanging out with those people for 40 minutes. He is wandering with them for 40 years. Who do you think is not about to pass up this opportunity to get on into the promised land the next time it's offered? Caleb. He exemplifies what Andrew Peterson calls a long obedience in the same direction. And we'll see this again in just a bit. But Joshua chapter 14, look with me at verse six. I'm going to read it. Then the people of Judah. Okay, pause. Got to tell you this. Joshua, excuse me. Caleb is not from the tribe of Judah. He is from the tribe of Issachar. This was not what he was going to be allotted. But he had been told by God, you will get the land that you spied out. That's why Caleb is in here. It's really kind of a minor point. But when you think about being in the land of Judah, as it plays out further in Kings, the northern tribes are gone much earlier. There are actually good kings that reign and rule in Judah a little bit. They still have a slow decline and then get hauled off by the Babylonians. But when you look at Judah, excuse me, the land of Judah, and you look at where Caleb is, he get you know, his, his people and his progeny get to hang out in a good spot for a little bit longer. But anyway, okay. The people of Judah came to Joshua Gilgal and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made my made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land in which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said. These 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in that day. 
that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. Now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. And then Joshua blessed him and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of, Je of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now the name Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, and the land had rest for more. Look with me in chapter 15, 13 through 19. It's the back end of the story. According to the commandment of the Lord of jo Lord to Joshua, he gave Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the people of Judah, Kirith Araba, that is Hebron, Arbo, the father of Anak. And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Sheshai and Ammon and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. And he went up from there against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name of Debir formerly was Kirith Saphir. And Caleb said, whoever strikes Kirith Saphir and captures it to him, will I give Aksa, my daughter, as a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, as wife. And she came to him, and she urged him to ask her father for a field, and she got off her donkey, and Caleb said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, give me a blessing, since you have given me the land of Negeb, give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. How many times do you think you heard the Lord said, come out of Caleb's passage? Mm -hmm. And how many times, including the name Moses being used as God's mouthpiece? Six times in nine verses. <clears throat> He's all about what God has said. Here is a man who meditated on the word of the Lord day and night for 40 years. The man knew the word of God, and he obeyed it for, 40, for 45 years now, we know. And if you think about Caleb, y'all, he was a slave in Egypt. We never think about Caleb in Egypt. Caleb was 40 when they came out of Egypt, right? He lived most of his life. I mean, this is a man transformed by the word of God through Moses. Right. He was just a nobody and he sees what God has is offering him and he takes it with both hands. Side note, I have a kid named Caleb. This is a really important story for me. OK. Um, and he is coming forward to Joshua. who he might, I mean, think about it. There are millions of people I mean, like there's a heap of Israelites. He might not have just seen Joshua all the time. Right. I mean, maybe he hadn't seen him in 35 years. You know, I don't know. But he is asking Joshua for nothing more than what God has just promised him already. That's all he's asking for. God said it. Can you make it true? Like God said it. And Caleb's eyes are not focused on himself or his enemies, but the one who keeps his promises. And his physicality, I love this part. Dale Ralph Davis, I read this to y'all before, has this amazing, <laughs> amazing thing. What accounts for such vigor and expectancy in a senior citizen of Israel? <laughs> I don't think of, of Caleb as a senior citizen, but, but he has, he's 85. Aunt Lou, yep. can you imagine fighting the Anakim? You're not 85. I know. I know she's not 85. But she's closer than I am. Ellen, let me, this is something that just came to me. And I think the Lord speaks through you and all of us in here. And there's a reason. For everything that is in the Old Testament is repeated again. Everything Christ promise shows up in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And when I was young and just became a Christian, even though I was raised in the church, I was 21 before I really understood the gospel. Mm -hmm. What was given to me then is totally different than what's given to me now. Now much is more required. Mm -hmm. And I have now the faith of knowing that no matter what happens in my life, God uses it for a reason that will fulfill his purpose in mm -hmm, me, period. Mm -hmm. That's true. And that's the way to look at things that are not so pleasant right now. Mm -hmm. And perhaps Caleb 45 years ago 
wasn't truly, totally spiritually ready to go into the promised land. He probably was. I don't know. But listen to what this says. Caleb's vivid re recollection of, of Yahweh's goodness and mercy in the past certainly helps to explain his current boldness. But verse 12 itself suggests two facts that shocked the adrenaline into Caleb's faith. One was extreme, the extreme difficulty of the task. It is if Caleb says to Joshua, you remember the sneers you and I heard that day when the other 10 spies brought back the majority report? Remember all that whimpering about large fortified cities and large swaggering Anakim? And how all they could say for days was, we're not able. Well, that's exactly why I want this inheritance. There are fortified cities and real live Anakim. Precisely what caused Israel to shrink from the task in Numbers 13 gave Caleb the passion to assume it. And then Dale Ralph Davis gives this really great example. I remember reading a story Kennedy Smart related in the Presbyterian Journal a few years ago. An American shoe company sent a salesman to a foreign country. He had hardly arrived before he cabled for money to come home. His reason, no one over here wears shoes. <laughs> the company brought him back and sent another salesman over. Soon, that salesman cabled, send me all the shoes that you can manufacture. The market is absolutely unlimited. No one over here has shoes. <laughs> it's your perspective. Caleb is like, give me the biggest, baddest guy you can. I want to see God open the floodgates. It is so awesome. And I love how in verse 12, he says, it may be. Right? Go Johnson. ahead. Johnson did the same thing. It may be that the Lord is on our side. Yes. That's the very same word. It is, it is, he is not, he's humble. And he realizes God doesn't have to. He's humble with his open hands. It may be. Can't you just hear him? He may let me do it. I think his faith is also, I mean, God has allowed him to maintain his strength. Yeah. I mean, that's that's just supernatural. He's saying, I'm 85 and I can still go to battle. Look at me. <laughs> I'm 85. It may be that I can do it. Exactly. And he knows better than to presume about is the Lord God on his side or not. He's reaching his hand out to the commander of the Lord's army and says, can I be on yours? Let me be part of your team and taking out the Anakim. Chapter 15 tells us that Caleb leads the people to drive out the sons of Anak. The people like, like the, the, the biggest, baddest of the Anakim, right? They're named specifically because they were so big and so bad. Through his leadership, he also brings the spotlight on his son-in-law, Othniel, who is going to be the first judge in the line of the judges, and just know that the cycles of the judges is a downward spiral. It's, it's just a swirl down the drain to the bitter end, but Othniel is a high point, and it just kind of goes a little bit downhill from there. But Othniel is following in his father-in-law's footsteps, and his daughter is saying, would you even give me e even more? The abundance of a father's provision and exemplified in Caleb? I'm not just going to give you one. I'll give you two springs. Just, it's amazing. Caleb fixes his eyes on the God of his inheritance and wholeheartedly believes what God has said. And what is his reward? Just what God said it would be. The promised land and peace in the promised land. Caleb is... Long-suffering, sustained, obedient. He believes the word of God and his obedience is breathtaking. He fights the biggest, baddest. He is strong and mighty and blessing upon blessing given out of him and through him to the people of God. <laughs> that is what we see in Caleb. In chapter 15, we have very specific boundary lines drawn for Judah. And Caleb is tucked in the middle. He's right there in Hebron, right? And yet, here we are in verse 63. What do we see? They don't drive them all out. But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive out. And so we are 
leaving Caleb, who wholeheartedly followed after the Lord. And we're going to go look at what it looks like when we have not a whole heart following after the Lord. I'm sorry, it's more like wah wah. Um, we have a slide and it continues. Um, we see Caleb driving out giants of the land, but the, Jeb but the Jebusites remained. Why does it say they remained? Verse 14. Why does it say they remained? 15, 14. No, I'm wrong. Oh, 63. Oh, wait, no. Oh, yeah. This is verse 63. Excuse me. 15, 63. The very last verse in chapter 15. Why does it say that Judah could not, excuse me, why the Jebusites remained? Because they, they could not drive them out. Yeah. Don't be deceived. Yeah. Could they or did they just not obey? They didn't. Don't be deceived. No, they could. They didn't. Just like we could. Not. They chose not to. They won't drive them out. And it never tells you why. And this is why I think it never tells you why. Because we know why. They didn't want to. That's always the reason why. Why did you do? I mean, I'm such an idiot. Always asking my kids, why did you do that? That's a dumb, dumb question. I need to stop asking it. The answer is because I wanted to. Because I felt like it. That's my answer. Always. Don't you think that they were also, I mean, after what happened to Gideon and I, they're sort of like, oh, we can sort of take advantage of these people. They can actually sort of help us. Absolutely. If we can sort of. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can We can mold them and, you know, have them do what we want. But we'll work. I mean, it seems like over and over again, that's what they were saying is that they were uh -huh. working for you. They put them to work. Absolutely. And that comes up. Yeah. And it's this slide. We have, so we see them settling for less. We see them snuggling up to their sin, and we see them setting their eyes wrongly. That's what we're going to be looking. Can you see that here? So, and we see them setting their eyes wrongly. That's what we're about to look into. Those three things as a consequence of this half heart. Yes, Linda. Which is kind of like they thought they were free in the office. So, God, exactly. God had told them, you can allow the Gibeonites to come in and be your you know, water carriers and what, whatnot, mm -hmm. but God didn't mm -hmm. tell them that they would allow them to mm -mm. No, he was actually, yeah, no, he was, at, he was actually very, very clear. Devote them to destruct them, to destruction, drive them out. They will be a snare to you. Well, that's too much for me. Surely he didn't mean that. It's too hard. They didn't do it because they didn't want to. Their hearts were not wholly following the word of God. That's all there is to it. It's really easy. God doesn't have to explain what happened here. We know what happened because it happens to us all the time. It's always revealing of a heart. We have this beautiful example of a heart that beats wholly after God with Caleb juxtaposed with some very different sets of hearts. And let's look at the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's people. We can, we're going to fly through them. This is a real, real easy. Chapter 16, shortened to the point, begins with Ephraim. What does verse 10 say right there at the bottom? Didn't drive out the Canaanites. Nope. Flip. Done. 16. Verse 17, chapter 17. We're in Manasseh. We'll come back to the daughters of uh, Zelophea. Bel I don't know how to say that name, but we'll come back to them in a second. So bookmark that. But chapter 17 could be just as short as chapter 16 was. What does verse 12 and 13 say? Could not take possession. Mm -mm. They persisted dwelling in the land and they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not utterly drive them out. Ooh. And they say, wouldn't it just be easier if we put them into slavery for us? <laughs> the hearts displayed settle for less. They settle for a lesser reward and they get what they bargained for, which is way 
less. Cheap, short-term satisfaction. And isn't that just a great definition of sin? It just is. I love what Sarah said last week regarding the Gibeonites. We like to make peace with our enemies, which is so true. We like to make peace with our enemies that we are commanded to devote for, to destruction. The Sermon on the Mount teaches about what Jesus has to say about the seriousness of sin. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Jesus was speaking in hyperbole because he knew it's not the hand that causes you to sin. It's not the eye that causes you to sin. What's causing you to sin? Your heart. Your heart. And he knows he's the heart surgeon. He's, he's got to be the one to replace that. But he wants us to see the seriousness of our sickness. And that's what Israel is not willing to see. God is no fool. He knows the easy slide to the hardness of heart. And sin can be fun. Anybody who is intellectually honest needs to be willing to admit that. Sin can be fun. It can even be rewarding for the short term. It's not lasting. It's less than the goodness that God has prepared for those who love him. But we must be honest about the temptations of sin. They were. Um, it's me being too lazy to consider the long-term effects of my consumer behavior on God's creation and thinking that I will never have to pay for those consequences. My great, great grandchildren are literally going to be cleaning up my plastic mess for sure. It's not my problem. Those jokes on TV, well, I just, I have not laughed so hard in a long time, even if it's about inappropriate sex outside of marriage. It's just a show. I know it's not real. It's not doing anything. My kids, my parents, my husband just make me so furious. I can't help it if I explode. It's just how I'm wired. Um, I have to have an outlet to just be me, right? Like, I can't live without my phone. I, ha I, I mean, I have to have it when I need it because the world revolves around whether or not I answer that text in a timely manner. Who on earth do I think I am? We know the Bible says that all of our lives are his. We are bought. Abraham Kuyper famously said, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. And when we withhold a bit of our hearts for him, there are, from him, there are consequences. Imagine a ship taking a two degree shift, right? It's gonna wind up in a completely different destination over time. That is not a sustained long obedience in the same direction. That's a very different direction long-term than what we see displayed in the heart of Caleb. And we will see the way this settling for less and snuggling up to their sin will for sure take them right off into exile, straight out of the promised land. We will, you see that as you continue to read the Bible. As if we don't already have a clear enough picture of the contrast between the whole heart and the half heart, the narrator carried along by the Holy Spirit gives us a second view of a half heart in a different way. Let's look at the tribes of Joseph. They come back to Joshua. Thank you. So glad for another example. On page 51, number four, you, well, you know about the Canaanites, right? You looked at the Bible verses there. But what do the tribes of Joseph have to say in chapter 17? What are they saying to him? 
verse 14. What are they saying? We need more land. And, jo and Joshua says, and I keep, uh, y'all, and forgive me, the Joseph's, Joshua's, Judah's, Jeremiah's, Je I, I, I'm going to get them. I, I'm sure that I say Joseph a lot when I mean Joshua, but you know, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Anyway, the tribe of Joseph, his kids, come to Joshua and they say, we need more. And Joshua says, okay, then take it. And what do they say? They say, we can't. They say, we can't. Those people got chariots and stuff. They're big. They're bad, right? They fix their eyes on the big bad chariots. Caleb had a shocking, stunning obedience. Let me take him on. Give me the biggest, baddest chariots and giants that you got. These people are not focused on the right thing. You looked at, um, all through all these Psalms on page 53, just the word of God poured out about the victory is his, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses and all of that, but we ought to be trusting in the Lord God. The problem is not outside of Israel. Those people had watched the mighty hand of God. And the Canaanites had watched the mighty hand of God and they feared the mighty hand of God. Their hearts were like water. But the people of Israel didn't fear the hand of God as much as the Canaanites did. Have any of y'all seen the movie Jaws 3? It's a classic. Anybody? <laughs> Speaking of movies we should and should not be watching, um, I've memorized it. I've seen it so many times. So Jaws 1 happens out on the ocean. It's the big bad Jaws. Jaws 2 happens out on the ocean, but it's a sailboat. Well, Jaws 3 happens in a theme park, a water theme park. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Jaws, they find a great white. This is like a theme park, a water theme park that's like kind of out in the ocean area. And it has like gates and stuff and whatever. And they, they catch a baby great white. And the people that run the park go to the director and like, we have to shut down the park. The baby was caught inside the park. The mother is inside the park. And right then you see this big bad mother like coming into this restaurant that's underwater, whatever, anyway. And you see her then take down the park. Israel is looking outside. And the whole time we're looking and we're going, uh-uh. <laughs> The mother is inside the park. <laughs> the big bad problem is inside the heart of Israel. I never thought I'd be able to use Jaws 3 as an example of <laughs> illustration, but this is so, it is so true. It is so true. The destruction of the people of God is not in those chariots. It is right inside their hearts. It's that slow slide. We emphasize the villain's outside of us as the reason for our struggles and we are playing right into satan's hands god warned against it deuteronomy chapter 7 17 through 24 if you say in your heart these nations are greater than i how can i dispossess them which is exactly what they're saying <laughs> You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all Egypt, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand, the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So will the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, the Lord your God will send hornets among them until those who are left and hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be in dread of them for the fear of your God. The Lord, your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. The Lord, your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. You may not make an end of them at once. He told them it's going to take a while. Lest the wild beasts grow too numerous for you, but the Lord your God will give them over to you and throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. And he will give their kings into your hand and you shall make their name perish from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. We never hear of hornets anywhere else coming forward. Do you know why? They didn't do it. We don't get to see the hornets. 
That's a big fat bummer because that would be a really great passage that my kids would love to see. <laughs> you never get to see the hornets because the people of God were not, they, they didn't take him in his word. They were too focused on the chariot, not focused on the mighty hand of God who could take care of them into the promised land and help them help them conquer. The tribes of Israel struggled with half hearts in different ways, but the outcome was the same. They got what they were willing to take. And this, this substandard takeover of the promised land continues. And C.S. Lewis in Screw Tape Letters has this great paragraph. And Screw Tape Letters is written from the perspective of this chief demon writing to his mentee nephew demon. And um, he says, he's, the, the, the nephew demon is kind of frustrated that he doesn't get to make this, his subject do some really big bad sins. He says, you will say that these are very small sins. And doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy, and the enemy in this case being God. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Your affectionate uncle, screw tape. We see in chapter 17, the daughters of Zelophad, and I just wanna give that quick bright spot for a second. We, they're in there for a few purposes, but I want to zero in on just one as it pertains. This is page, as it pertains to our lessons. This is page 50, number two. Once again, we see a group of women, no less, approaching Eliezer and Joshua, claiming back the words of promise that God had already said to them. And when it's time to allot the land, they go straight to the priest and claim God's promise to them. And what happens? They get it. They're claiming nothing less than what God had already promised them, and they receive it. He said they would. They believed him. And years later, at the time of allotment, uh, this time of allotment, they are found still believing in the word of God. And God Himself puts these bright spots in the story of His word for us, so we can see it. It's not that moment, I mean, it, it, it's, it's like that moment where we realize, oh no, we're falling asleep at the wheel. It's like the gentle honk of the horn, right? Um, my favorite, the sort of sad bumper sticker, it said, it said oh, where am I going and why am I in this handbasket? <laughs> <laughs> and that's true, right? Honk the horn, church, hear God's word of warning. See these bright examples, weigh them against your own heart and repent and follow God wholeheartedly. Psalm 86 says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Obedience. Let me walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear the chariots and I may fear your name. That's why we want the undivided heart, because we want the eyes to see what we truly ought to be seeing. I want to leave us, though, where we started. And this is what the good news is. I feel like I've been kind of hammering the big bad news. But let us always couch it in the good news. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. He welcomes us home. Worn, <laughs> haggard, because he has already paid for our forgiveness. And I'm, I've got time, so I'm going to read one quick story for you. Heaps of books today. I've been all over the map. Y'all are going to be like, she needs to be on medicine. Okay. <laughs> this story is by Patricia St. John. It's called The White Handkerchief. And I can go fast. 
The man sat on the pavement beside the bus stop and stared at the stone. So a few people turned to look at him, his unshaven face, his slumped shoulders, the broken shoes, but he was not aware of the glances because he was reliving his life. He was no longer a hungry tramp who had slept last night under the railway arch. He was in his mind a boy who lived in a small red brick house up the next street more than 20 years ago. Perhaps they had bulldozed over, bulldozed over the house by now. He hoped they hadn't crushed the pansies. It was strange how well he could remember the pansies and the swing his dad had made for him and the path where he had learned to ride his bike. They had saved up for months to buy that bike. The man shrugged impatiently for the brightness of those pictures hurt him and his memory traveled on another 10 years. The bike had been exchanged for a motorcycle and it become to, he began to come home less. He had a job by then and plenty of friends and mom and dad had seemed a bit sad and gray and the pups were a lot more fun. He did not really want to remember those years, nor the day when the debts had piled up and had gone home meaning to ask for money. They had made him a cup of tea and had not liked to mention, and he had not liked to mention what he had come home for, but he knew exactly where his dad kept the money. And later on, when his parents went out to the garden, it was quite easy to help himself to what he wanted. That was the last time he had seen them. He had not wanted to go home again after that, and they had lost track of him. He had gone abroad, and they knew nothing about the years of wandering and the prison sentence, but locked away in his cell at night, he had thought about, he thought a lot about them. Sometimes when he tossed awake and the moonlight moved across the wall, he used to wonder, once free, he would love to see them again if they were still alive, and always supposing that they still wanted to see him. <laughs> And when his time was up, he found a job in the town, but he could not settle. Something seemed to be drawing him home with an urge he could not get away from. And every time he went for a walk, something reminded him, a clump of pansies, a child on a swing, a little boy running home from school. He could not forget the small red brick house. He did not want to arrive penniless, so he walked or hitchhiked a good deal of the long journey home. He could have arrived earlier, but 20 miles away, he was suddenly overcome with misgivings. What right had he to walk in like this? Could they ever reconcile the haggard man he had become with the boy that they had loved who had so bitterly disappointed them? He bought some food and spent most of the day sitting under a tree. And the letter he posted that evening was quite short, but it had taken him hours to write. And it ended in these words. I know it is unreasonable of me to suppose that you want to see me. So it's up to you. I'll come to the end of the road early Thursday morning. And if you want me home, hang a white handkerchief in the window of my old bedroom. And if it's there, I'll come on. If not, I'll wave goodbye to the house and go on my way. And now it was Saturday morning. Excuse me, now it was Thursday morning. He had arrived at the end of the street. It was still there, but having got there, he felt in no hurry at all. He just sat down on the pavement and stared at the stones. Well, he could not put it off forever. And after all, they might have moved. If the handkerchief was not there, he would make a few inquiries before actually leaving the town. He had not yet had the courage to face what he would do if they were there and simply did not want him. He got up painfully, for he was stiff from sleeping outside and the street was still in shadow. Shivering a little, he walked slowly toward the old oak tree where he knew he could see the old house as clear as clear. He could not look till he got there. He stood under the boughs with his eyes shut for a moment and then he drew a long breath and looked. And then he stood staring. The sun was already shining in a little red brick house, but it no longer seemed like a little red brick house for every wall was festooned with white. Every window was hung with sheets, pillowcases, towels, tablecloths, handkerchiefs, and table napkins. And white muslin curtains trailed across the roof from the attic window. It looked like a snow house gleaming in the morning light. His parents were taking no risks. The man threw back his head and gave a cry of relief. And then he ran up to the street and straight into the open front door. <sighs> he loves you so much. Let us turn from our ways and live like residents of that home. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you have loved us so much. You've given us your word that we don't have to wonder what you think. We know for you tell us that we are beloved. So beloved, in fact, that you gave your only son and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So, Lord, look, God, give us hearts that beat fully and wholeheartedly grasp to that, that we might be radical in our obedience to you. And then it might shock a wondering world that they might know you, the God whom we serve. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're going to take um, prayer requests. I'm going to stop recording.